My name is David Sherna, and I am the executive director of No Barriers. And we have an incredible show lined up for you tonight, and really a terrific four days plan where I know many of you will try things you've never tried before, learn things that you never expected, and have a life-changing experience. The first folks I want to thank before we bring up uh, our MC are the people who made it here from far away. We have folks from Thailand. We have folks, woo! We have folks from Japan. We have folks from the East Coast, from the West Coast. We have Utah. And we have just about everything in between. I want to thank each and every one of you. I know that it is not easy to make this journey to come to the No Barriers Summit. And we are thrilled that you decided to come here and spend the next four days with us. It is going to be an extraordinary experience. And so thanks to each and every one of you for making the commitment to be here. I would also like to thank Wells Fargo, Phillips, Lumber Liquidators, and all of our partners, our corporate partners, who help make this experience possible. You may not know, but uh, your price of admission is about a quarter of what it costs to put this event on. And it is really because, not only because of the cash contributions, but all the in-kind donations and staff support here. And so let's give a round of applause, please, to all of our wonderful sponsors. I want to thank our uh, co-hosts, our local partners at the National Ability Center. They're an extraordinary organization. Woo, 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 woo. If you don't know about the National Ability Center yet, you are destined to know a lot more about them in the days to come. The National Ability Center is located right here in Park City, Utah. They've got a campus that some of our clinics are going to be at that if you're attending some of the clinics, you might get to go to their campus. They're hosting an event for us on their campus tomorrow where you can take a bus and go and see our film festival. Uh, the rain is guaranteed to stop by tomorrow. That's what I've been told by all the weathermen in Utah. So we are going to have a great few days. And I want to thank the National Ability Center for everything they did. They organized all of the clinics that you're about to experience in the next three days. We have more than 45 organizations offering 125 different activities, which is truly extraordinary, by far the most we've ever done. And it's in large part due to the hard work of the National Ability Center. So thank you so much. Woo, 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 woo. And finally, uh, it takes a village to put this on. And so I do want to say a special word of thanks to my staff at No Barriers and to our amazing board of directors who've been working for 15 months to bring this event together. So thank you. I had the, the great pleasure of spending our sunny morning up in the mountains hiking uh, to the top of a 12,000 foot peak with uh, 70 of my new friends. And as I was hiking up this morning, I was thinking about why I love the No Barriers Summit so much. And I got to hike this morning. The way I spent my morning was meeting some extraordinary individuals whose uh, lives have been changed by our work and who are now a part of our community. So I met warriors from our No Barriers Warriors program who have been in our programs for one, two, three years and who told me stories that even though it's been a year or more since they had an interaction with their organization, it still lives deeply within them and it really transformed them. I had the opportunity to meet individuals like a woman who uh, suffers from PTS because she was in the World Trade Center when it collapsed and she watched her friends not make it and she was fortunate enough to make it. I had the opportunity to meet some of our wonderful sponsors who told stories about how working with no barriers had changed their own lives and their own perceptions. And then later in the day, I was lucky enough to meet some of our no barriers youth who are a part of our middle and high school programs that we do across the nation and hear their stories. And, and as I thought about, wow, look at this diverse group of folks coming together. What is it? What is it that brings us here to Park City? Why did we all journey here to Park City from afar? 
And I think it really comes down to just a couple of reasons. I, I'm lucky enough to read hundreds of testimonials about the power of no barriers in people's lives. And one of the fundamental things that I think unites all of us, no matter where we're from, no matter what our background is, is this desire that I think is, is a, a fundamental human desire to live a life of purpose and meaning. I think all of us crave that life of purpose and meaning. And we get so many people who come to No Barriers because they believe that. We also get people who come to No Barriers because they also know another thing about the human experience. And that is that it's hard. It's tough. We all have barriers in our lives. And as we strive to live lives of purpose and meaning and be our best and go out there and have adventures, it's not always easy. And so each and every one of us has our own story of what brought us here. But I think we're united by this desire to live lives of purpose no matter what crap gets in our way. And I think we all know and will believe and come to see over the next four days that what's within us is stronger than what's in our way. <laughs> so what I encourage each of you to do, uh, I know everyone signed up for the amazing list of clinics. You're going to hear speakers, entertainment is please, aside from just having your own personal experience, reach out to the person next to you and have a conversation with someone you've never met. Because when I think back on the summits I've been to, it's the conversations that I take home with me. The things I learn most are the things that are from the people right next beside me. So I want you to enjoy, have a great adventure, and um, I'm gonna make sure I didn't miss any logistics here because we want to get this moving so that you guys can hear some of our incredible speakers. I got them all. <laughs> so without further ado, we have an incredible uh, MC for you tonight. I don't know uh, who out there knows Timmy O'Neill, the name Timmy O'Neill. <laughs> Woo! We got some Timmy O'Neill fans. And so, Timmy is going to be our official MC for the evening ceremonies. And uh, if you don't know Timmy's story, I'll just share a couple of things that I've learned uh, in learning about Timmy's background and history. First of all, he lived in a cave for 60 days in Joshua Tree National Park. A cave, that's right. He spent 60 days in a cave. He went on and uh, has done the first ascent of several very impressive and difficult peaks. He has also pioneered some of the most incredible new adaptive ways to climb. Timmy is an adventurer, a climber, but he also started Paradox Sports, a terrific organization, adaptive organization, that does wonderful things for people to get outdoors and explore the world. And so I know you guys are going to enjoy the show tonight. We are so grateful that Timmy has joined us, and I wish you a wonderful summit. Thank you. Dave Sherna, make some noise for Dave Sherna right now. That was compelling, articulate, and the work of an executive director. Wow, my name is Timmy O'Neill. How are you all doing tonight? Come on, for real, how are you doing? And why are there so many empty seats? VIP people, you're done being very important. Now you're very missed. Come over here right now. On the count of three, say VIPs, get over here. One, two, three. Come on, get over here now. We're not going to keep going until we get these seats filled right here. Come down. Comedy, public speaking is best experience up close and personal. So I'm waiting. Where's Rob Raker? Enough with the facts, Raker, and get over here. Where is Raker? Raker, go, come and sit down. Harlan, come up here and sit down. Kristen, come and sit down. We need people to sit down. Come over here and take some seats. If you have a seat beside you, put your hand in the air. Yes. Come down here, people, from up there and beyond. Come down. Bring your beverages. Get up close and personal. Josh Blue needs you. I need you. Amy needs you. John needs you. Jack needs you. Get down here. Keep coming. Another time. Let's say it again. VIPs, get down here. One, two, three. VIPs, get down here. Enough talking about yourselves already. Enough about me. What do you think about me? Boring. Come on. These people on stage need your love right now. And while they're walking, I'd like to do a little sign of love. 
Look at this beautiful place, Park City. I like to do this thing, the moment of silence. And that moment of silence is in remembrance of those who have passed, where we all will go into the great beyond. And as we have this moment of silence, remember those people. Their absence reminds us of our presence and our ability to thrive and get it done and be here at No Barriers and live the No Barriers life. So on the count of three, the biggest cheer you've ever done resounding off of these mountains. What I'd like to do is the loudest cheer you've ever done and immediately be quiet so we could hear the echo. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> they just heard that in Salt Lake City and they're on their way right now. Mostly to fill these seats. Come and fill these seats. Get down here, people. Don't make me. I'm going to have to come in there. I guess I'm going to have to go get people. All right, I'm coming to get you right now. Who's coming with me? Come on, we need you. Look at this family. Come down here right now. Come on, come with me. Come with me. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Come down. Who's coming down here? Get over here. I need you. I need you to come down to this front. Charlie's coming down there. Get down there. You two, come on, get down here. Adaptive Adventures, get in the house and get in those seats right now. Come down. Are you coming down? Who else? Be not afraid. Hang in the back. Look at this posse right here. They're on their cell phones right now or something. Here, come on. I'm getting you guys right now. Come with me. Come on. Come on. You're busted. And you're coming with me too, Hunter. Get going. Come on. We need to fill these seats. Josh Blue needs love. I need love. Get down here. Keep going. Don't turn around. We've got seats to fill. The sooner we get these seats filled, the quicker we can get on with this show, okay? Sick of this. Housekeeping. We got more seats. Over here. Come here. Now. Get over here. Okay. Anybody in a wheelchair, you already have your seat, so bring it down here. No problem. One of the silver linings of paralysis. Okay. <sighs> All right. We did a pretty good job. All right. Okay. So I'm here because I love what this is about. Uh, I have a brother named Sean O'Neill. He's a T12 paraplegic. He's sitting right there. On the count of three, we love you, Sean. One, two, three. We love you, Sean. Yeah. And his injury introduced me to injuries and introduced me to that conversation you have that says life isn't over but begun again in a new way. I'd like to bring out uh, John Bramblett. He is a curious, gentle-natured Texan out of Dallas. Uh, 13 years ago, one year after going blind, he started to paint. And his painting is an expression of what's inside of him. Because he told me that people think because he's blind, he's no longer there. And so in order to answer that question, that feeling, he paints. Seven years ago, he began to paint uh, doing live demonstrations. And now he's done it in over 30 countries. Please welcome John Bramblett and Echo to the stage. Um, and, and John, how are you? Man, I am doing great. I've had the best time, and this conference hasn't even started yet. That's the best thing. How pumped are you, dude? Man, I am so excited. I just can't, I can't tell you. Okay, we'll get to painting, and this is going to be this unfolding right now where he's going to be painting uh, for the duration of the show. Uh, I believe that he has already done several of the words that we're using to express what it is to have the no barriers, elements, and lifestyles, and this will be uh, the final one. All right, so Wells Fargo, this is the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, we celebrate this important, that's it, make some noise, come on. I can't hear you, mostly because I'm hearing impaired, okay. And it's okay to laugh, it's actually the relief of tension, okay. Thank you, who was that? That was amazing, okay. All right, uh, okay, we celebrate this important civil rights Act at the No Barrier Summit, where we foster growth, promote access, and showcase technological advances all in one inspirational environment. Wells Fargo, in collaboration with No Barriers, produced a short video series to debut on their YouTube channel. The series highlights leading disability rights advocates in order to increase awareness and expand support to ensure fair and equal treatment of people with disabilities. Tonight, we have a sneak peek an exclusive preview from the Wells Fargo Real Stories of the ADA. Please enjoy.
Caption, 1990 to 2015, Wells Fargo celebrates the Americans with Disabilities Act. Copyright 2015, Wells Fargo Bank. The following video shows seven people in their daily life discussing how the ADA has impacted their lives. Featured speakers, Andy Imperato, Executive Director, Association of University Centers on Disabilities. Alice Wong, Staff Research Associate, UCSF School of Nursing and founder, Disability Visibility Project. J.R. Martinez, U.S. Army veteran, author and speaker. Chris Guin, founder and president, Queerability, Deborah Talukas, Retirement Compliance Consultant, Wells Fargo, Sarah Doherty and Kareth Paraloid, Co-Founders, Sidesticks Ventures Incorporated, Eric Weinmayer, Co-Founder and Board Vice President, No Barriers USA, and author, speaker, Touch the Top. When I was in college, I remember I was looking for a job as a dishwasher, and I went around to all these restaurants, and none of them had a job for me. They were all they all had reasons why I couldn't do the job. There'd be knives, I'd cut myself, I wouldn't be able to find where to put things away. Uh, and, and so I never actually was able to get a job. Most disabled people were shut-ins. They were people that um, weren't able to access uh, the environment. I would say there was a lot of prejudice against a variety of disability groups. When I was only 16, that was in 1990, and that's when the ADA passed, and it came at the right time. Uh, within a few years, I went away to college and on to graduate school, and the ADA has made a huge impact on my ability to access spaces and programs. I'm, I'm a commuter, so I, I take a lot of public transportation to get to work, and our entire transportation infrastructure is more human-friendly because of the ADA. And I'm somebody that's getting older. I'm turning 50 this year. I feel like the ADA is making the world easier for me as somebody who's getting older to navigate. It wasn't until I went to uh, Western Kentucky University where I learned about uh, my rights as a person with a disability. I, I would not have gotten a college education and I would not have gotten all the opportunities and, 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 uh, and privileges that come with having a college education if it weren't for the ADA. It's been a movement that has allowed doors to open for all types of disabilities. And uh, I'm really proud to be a disabled person. I don't know if I could have said that prior to uh, the ADA. ADA, essentially what it does is it kind of empowers individuals that have those disabilities to understand that they are crucial to this movement and to the improvement to whether it's, it's transportation, whether it's the logistics element, whether it comes to you know, pay, whether employment, you know, they are crucial. In the next 25 years, we really need to focus on economic self-sufficiency, one of the four pillars in the ADA. More and more, we need to evolve to an attitude that we're not doing, you know, we're not opening doors of opportunity just because it's the law, but we're doing it because we want to open up people's potential. I think there has to be more creativity in the way that a disabled person approaches a job. But really with the such low employment rates you really got to start in the very early stages of education and really tell educators parents and advocates that kids with disabilities have unlimited potential like any other non-disabled kid i see better research and support for um, what is called AAC, assistive, uh, Augmented Assistive Communication Technology, which helps people with invisible disabilities, um, whether it's autism or other developmental disabilities, communicate. I think making sure that um, people that need assistive devices have access to those devices, and, 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 as, and as we were saying, not necessarily just the cheapest type of that device, just because they can make do, but something that will actually encourage them to be active and, and be more healthy. So I think that um, there's certainly a couple of things that, that need to happen going forward. People in wheelchairs and people um, who muscular dystrophy and crutches or whatever, they're blind, they don't have it as easy and we're, that's what we're trying to build towards. And that's how the ADA could, could help maybe years down the road. A society wins when they really bank on every individual's potential. And that's what I hope shifts over the next 25 years. Caption, Wells Fargo celebrates the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. This video was produced in collaboration with NoBarriersUSA.org. All right, thank you very much to Wells Fargo for that. A round of applause for one of our proud partners here at No Barriers.
so the cool thing about the culture of No Barriers in this event is so many people coming together dealing with a lot of different elements of adversity and overcoming that and dealing with that improvisational aspect that goes into overcoming. Uh, there is a difference between illness and identity, and I think this festival is about exploring and celebrating that culture. Josh Blue, you're probably familiar with him from our winner of the NBC's Last Comic Standing, or from his specials on Showtime and Comedy Central, or most recently from Ron White's Vegas Salute to the Troops on CMT. He's a former member of the U.S. Paralympic soccer team. He puts the cerebral and cerebral palsy. Please welcome from Denver, Colorado, Josh Blue! <laughs> No barriers. All right, yeah. I love you too, ma'am. All right, this is awesome. Uh, I'm so glad you guys invited me back. Uh, please feel free to come and sit on these blue rain catchers. Uh, I know a lot of you know who I am, and I know many of you maybe don't. And I'm sure the ones that don't right about now are like, I thought this was for disabled people, not the homeless. <laughs> How did he get up there? <laughs> Ta-da! There's a lot of uh, things. Good job on the painting, man. Uh, how do you know what the hell you're doing? Uh, maybe a bit much pink, but all right. Uh, who am I to say? <laughs> As long as the, uh, and you, over here, I can't help but notice you're mocking me. <laughs> so, I, I know when someone's saying everything that I say, okay? <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> These screens are nice for you guys, but I don't really like them, man, because it's like every time I try to look at myself, I look away. I'm like, <laughs> Shit! <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I don't know what happened to my voice. I'm sorry. It's, it's, uh, I love telling jokes. You guys can tell that uh, this is a lot of fun for me. I feel like the reason I'm comfortable coming up here is because I realized at a very young age that when one door closes, it locks behind you. So, <laughs> just got to go to the next house. Use a window if you have to. Just get in there, that's all. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Sorry, I know swearing offends people, and if it does, I apologize. But just think of it this way. I just have really well-timed Tourette's. <laughs> that's the great thing about having a disability. When you have one, you can have them all. Nobody's going to call you on that shit. <laughs> All right, team, yeah. All right. This has got to be the weirdest make-a-wish ever. <laughs> Some of you guys are not ready for that one. All right, I'm just, just testing the waters. Better buckle up, there's about 20 more minutes of this shit. <laughs> the dog sleeping. All right, great. You know, guys, I've realized that through my comedy, I've been able to help uh, to bring disability into the limelight. And uh, I want you guys to know that wasn't my intention. <laughs> I'm up here for very selfish reasons. It's so weird. People are like, oh, you're so inspirational. I'm like, I'm telling dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> How low is your bar? <laughs> Got to look up to my dick jokes? OK. okay. I hate that too. I'm sure some of you guys get this. Oh, you're so inspirational. 
all that you've accomplished and all that you've overcome. I'm like, well, that's really nice of you to say, but I got to tell you, I'm a little uninspired because there's nothing wrong with you and you ain't done shit. <laughs> <laughs> Why you gotta look at my dumb ass to feel better? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it's weird. I hear about a lot of different different disabilities, and that's cool to learn about. But sometimes it doesn't even make sense. People are like, oh, you're so inspirational. You know, my uncle has rickets. Like, <laughs> I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> Sounds itchy to me. <laughs> Itchy Ricketts. <laughs> That'd be a good band name. <laughs> also sounds like something an old school Batman would say, like, holy Itchy Ricketts, Robin. <laughs> Blam! <laughs> Pow! <laughs> Ricketts. <laughs> and Ricketts will jack you up, man. It's the finishing move. Uh, thanks, seven of you on that one. Right. <laughs> that was weird. It's been weird. Uh, I get a lot of fan mail, and uh, that's nice. You know, people sending me nice stuff. Sometimes it's like overwhelming, like people just writing so many nice things. Like, Sometimes I would just wish they'd be a dick about it, you know? And then sometimes people do write mean things, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that does hurt. <laughs> sometimes, uh, you know, when people uh, write mean things, I just look at it like that's their disability, you know? Yeah, whatever disability that is, where you got to write mean shit about a cripple on the Internet, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure they diagnosed that yet. <laughs> I think we all know there are a bunch of disabilities in the world, be it uh, mental or physical. But I think sometimes people don't realize that uh, there's also a very large spectrum of many of these different disabilities. And I think people could go their whole life, you know, just having like a dab of this and a touch of that and never know why they're an asshole. <laughs> it's not that you're an asshole, you've just been misdiagnosed. Probably just got a dab of Asperger's or something. <laughs> Throw in some bedwetting and Tourette's. No wonder you're mad. <laughs> Again, seven of you are having a great time. <laughs> There they are. <laughs> That's really coming along, man. Man. I wish you could see it. <laughs> it's great. Oh, <laughs> uh, you guys didn't know what I'm gonna laugh on that shit. That's great, Eric. Climbing Mount Everest. And he's gay. Uh, I, mean, I mean, blind, blind, sorry. I, mix those up sometimes. <laughs> how's, how's that? Uh, I don't know what happened to my voice, really. I'm sorry, guys, it's weird. It's like just another door closing, apparently. I was going to tell you guys, sometimes I get these letters or messages on Facebook that are really nice, but ultimately, it's just some really heavy shit. I'll get messages from people like, uh, you know, my dad was dying of cancer, and we watched your show, and he laughed, and I am like... Delete. <laughs> I can't be reading that shit, man. That's a lot of weight on a pothead's shoulders. 
That's where I live in Denver, Colorado. Everybody's been excited since we legalized marijuana. I want you guys to know that I've been treating it like it was legal for years. It's my medicine. I'm feeling much better. Oh, one lady this time, great. <laughs> oh. I uh, flew through the San Diego airport the other day and uh, I bumped into a large, muscly black cop with a German shepherd and he recognized me <laughs> and he starts chatting me up and I thought I was playing it cool. You, you all right, man? You'll, you'll find it. All right, there it is. There I am. <laughs> Did he flip me off? <laughs> How do you look away every time I look at you? That's weird. <laughs> Fuck <off. laughs> Anyway, huh. All right. there you are. <laughs> anyway, uh, this cop like was talking to me for like four minutes, and I thought I was like playing it cool. And he looks at me, and goes, "Don't worry, Josh." It's a bomb sniffing dog. <laughs> right, great, right, cool. What's your puppy's name? Who's your puppy? Can't make this shit up, man. Just my life. I got here uh, today. I've already had somebody at the airport run up to me and go, Hey, man, are you in town? Not yet. <laughs> you just keep looking for me, okay? I'll be wearing this. Can't make this shit up, man. I know, uh, I am excited to be here. This is a fun event. I uh, got to do it a while back, and I'm really glad to be, I'm actually doing some stuff tomorrow, some events. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Me fly fishing, come on. What's, better YouTube that shit. Won't be any hooks in my scalp at all, I'm sure. <laughs> Can't wait to catch the big one, you know. <laughs> I know, uh, I mean, it's amazing, this, this event. I mean, just, uh, I mean, but for a, Event called No Barriers, there sure are quite a few hoops to jump through, huh? <laughs> I made it. <laughs> I think we've all uh, experienced some cruelty over the years toward disability. You know, I think that's something that's weird. It took me a long time to understand when someone's being mean about disability. Usually it's just ignorance and fear. People push away because they're scared. But whenever someone's being mean about a disability, what I think they don't realize is that the disabled community is the largest minority group on the planet. Cause, yeah, because they pile us all together. If you're blind, get in a pile. If you're deaf, help the blind guy find a pile. <laughs> <laughs> if you got one leg, hop on. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll stop. I'll stop. It's too, too easy. Too easy. <laughs> but whenever someone's being mean, what I think they don't realize is not only are we the largest minority group on the planet, but we're also the only minority group that you can join at any time. Yeah. <laughs> You're just one bad bike ride away. <laughs> Red Rover, Red Rover. Don't make me help your dumb ass come over. <laughs> it's 
much fun as telling jokes is or something I love even more than doing this. And that's being a dad. Love it. Although I do think it's a little weird that you can accidentally make a person. <laughs> Seems like there should be a little more to it than that. I, guess. I can't even make a fucking birdhouse. <laughs> Sorry, Tourette's. Uh, <laughs> well, I made two amazing little people. It's like, and then I have a pile of cut up boards. You can't even make a cake that fast. You're like, oh, 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 oh shit, the baby's in there? <laughs> this is serious. <laughs> you got nine months to freak out. Just watching a woman you love grow some type of parasite in her belly. See it writhing around and they're like, ooh, shit, honey, you better get that out soon. I remember when I had worms, that messed me up for a minute. <laughs> then a little baby comes out and you, you call it a baby, but it's a person. Just a little needy person. Just come out and need shit right away. And then on forever. And kids are expensive, man. 70 cents a day, my ass. <laughs> Delete. Uh, uh. My son is seven years old. He's like an amazing climber. He can climb anything. He's like a spider monkey. And his mom is Japanese. I don't really think that has anything to do with it, but I uh, just picked a weird time to tell you that. So. <laughs> My son has the weirdest, like, sporadic eating patterns of any human I've ever met. Like, one day he'll eat, like, two carrots. Like, sure, that's all you want today? He's like, yeah. I'm Next day, I'll eat like seven hamburgers. You're like, what the hell? <laughs> One night, I, I watched him eat like five little hamburgers and then like potato salad and like chips. And he started eyeballing my burger like, Dad, you going to finish that? Uh, well, I was thinking about it, but let's see how far we can push this. <laughs> <laughs> I fed him two desserts that night. I was like, if you could have another one, I want to see this shit. <laughs> I'm laying him down to bed. He looks at me. He's like, Dad, I'm still hungry. I was like, me too, man. He's like, what's for breakfast? Uh, I don't know. I have to do some inventory. I'm hoping maybe it's a carrot day again. <laughs> My son's obsessed with the iPad. He loves playing games on there. And we let him do it for like, 30 minutes a day, and then we hide it from him, but he can find it like a drug-sniffing dog. <laughs> and in addition to my seven-year-old, I also have a five-year-old girl that lives in my house. You guys familiar with these psychopaths? <laughs> She's in charge of every goddamn thing on the planet. We're all scared of her. She comes in the room, I'm like, oh shit, she's coming over here. She says no to me like a grown man. I'm like, hey, sweetie, can I have that back? No, okay, cool. You just keep daddy's phone. Put it with my computer, wherever the hell that is. She's got this amazing ear for uh, food. Like she can hear a candy wrapper like two rooms over. <laughs> Rustle a chip bag, you hear doors kicking open. What do you got? Like, just take it, just take 
My daughter is the most stubborn human I've ever met. I put her on timeout in her lifetime like 987 times. And not once has it ever taken. My son was the exact opposite. Like, I'd be like, dude, you're on timeout. He'd walk himself over to the spot, sit himself down, and then like three hours later, I'd be like, oh shit, hey buddy. Ooh, Ooh hey. <laughs> Look, man, I don't even remember why you're here. You've obviously had some time to think about it. <laughs> Why don't you go find something you like to do? Go on. <laughs> My daughter, on the other hand, I can't even get her to look at the timeout spot. Her timeouts now are just me yelling at other people. Like, She's on timeout. Don't look at her. Don't talk to her. And if she approaches you, run away. In fact, everybody come over here and we'll all huddle in the corner until she's done doing whatever the she wants to do. Not saying I'm a good dad, but <laughs> I like it. It's fun. My daughter is very funny. Like my son wants to be funny. He is not funny. <laughs> well, it's not that he's not funny, I guess. It's just, uh, it's just that he's not funny to me. You know? I'm just uh, I'm not trying to be a comedy snob or nothing, but just don't like his brand. <laughs> Other people like his shit, you know? It's just, just not my cup of tea, you know? Because he's more of a more of a, a dick. So his, his humor is more dickish. You know, you got that one buddy that'll say any old dumb shit to you? That's my boy. He'll be doing some fine motor skill thing and be like, Daddy, you want to do this? Just kidding. Ha 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 ha. See how that's funny to other people? <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> I uh, went on a road trip with my two kids and I ended up in the back seat of the car between the car seats. And uh, there was another comic in the front seat and there was a driver. And uh, it's only a three hour ride. I was like, I can do this. And uh, about an hour into the trip, I go to try to take a drink out of a liter bottle of soda. And we hit a bump. And then I palsy just squeezed the shit out of the bottle. It was, <laughs> and it like shot down my throat. And then I just like sprayed it out. Like, like sprayed it. Everybody got some. Like made it to the windshield. I cleaned that up for a while. But an hour later, I'm working up enough courage to try to take another drink. And as I go to take the top off the bottle, my little five-year-old daughter goes, everybody put your raincoats on. <laughs> hey, you guys are awesome. Thank you very much. Give it up for Josh Blue. Josh Blue, make some noise! Very, very, very funny. Oh my God. Who else has a disability from laughing so hard right now? It's temporary. It's called a pulled funny bone. Okay. Let's check in here with Mr. Bramblett. John, how are you doing? Doing great, man. Whenever I hear a sound, I see color. So, man, the color that's been coming from everybody has been incredible. It just keeps getting brighter and brighter. I keep having to change things. And then explain, what, what do we see right here? I'm seeing mountains. I'm seeing the beautiful sunset or sunrise, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. So, in the, in the sunrise, it, it keeps getting brighter because all the, everybody's just so happy. And Josh was so funny. It goes, man, it's just. So, yeah, I have some people. Hopefully, we'll see at the end. But hopefully, there's some people summiting 
on the mountain because you got a summit. Well, here we, are. we got a summit. So I understand that you, you do landscapes, but then you also do portraiture, right? And how does the portraiture work? Because you have somebody sitting in front of you. How, how do you determine what they look like? I, I, I do it through touch. So I feel their faces or, or whatever it is in a painting. I, I use touch to, to do that. And then what about nude portraits? I especially use touch for that. So. <laughs> uh, well, cool. John, keep it going, and uh, thank you for your work. It's beautiful looking. Yeah. So uh, next up, we have a, a brilliant, adventurous, quirky San Francisco teenager who really understands the importance and benefits of volunteerism. And I'd like to, uh, we're going to share a video first here of Jack Weinstein, and he raised just about $50,000 for no barriers doing the one and a half mile swim from Alcatraz through those sharky cold waters back to the coast. So let's watch his video, then we'll bring him out. Uh, my name is Jack. I'm 15 years old, and I'm going to be swimming from Alcatraz to the San Francisco Harbor. I have a rare retinal disease. Uh, it affects one in a million people, and I've lost all sight in my right eye and about half of the sight in my left. Have fun, Jack. Oh my God, this water's really cold. You gotta just keep moving. You gotta power through it. You gotta keep working. You're good. You got it. You got it. Just hold on. Get ready. Go. I love you, buddy. The swim itself, the length is, is one challenge, but the, the hardest part for a lot of people is the fact that you're alone throughout the swim, it's dark throughout the swim, and it's very cold throughout the swim. And then you can add on the fact that there's current that can take you from a straight line to a giant curve. You look strong, Ben. You know, it's hard to see. You know, the glare's got to be killing you. My mom is a huge supporter of me. She is going to be paddling back home all the way from Alcatraz to San Francisco in a kayak and rooting for me the entire way. You're doing it. Here you are. And we're taking you home. When I turn my head, I breathe to the right. So my sighted eye, my left eye, is always going to be in the water. So I'm never really going to be able to see where I'm going. But I almost view the fact that I'm not going to be able to see as a freeing aspect. My entire life, I've been very scared of losing my sight. I've been very scared of not being able to see. And the fact that I'm breaking this barrier while not being able to see is almost reassurance that if something should ever happen, I can be okay. The big waves. What's within you is stronger than what's in your way. It's the central core of No Barriers USA. It's something that I hope that this swim will show some, some people, some people who are, are down and out, some people who have been dealt a bad hand and who feel like life is, is singling them out. Jack! Wait, wait. Wait! If anyone who's seeing this feels that way, I want you to know something. You have the power to get up and change that. You can physically change who you are. You can change the limitations that you have on yourself because everything is perception. He is uh, an inspiration to me every day. The hardest part was seeing it all the way from the other side, knowing that you had all that way to go. And then going through it. But it was awesome in the end. All right, please welcome to the No Barrier stage, Jack Weinstein. Come on out, Jack. Let's hear it. Hello everybody. So as you might have been able to gather from the video, my name's Jack. I'm a youth ambassador for No Barriers, which essentially means that I try to expand the sphere of influence that No Barriers has on, on people my age. And uh, while I may not be jumping around right now, you can be assured that I'm ecstatic about the next three days because I know what are coming. I know what's going to happen. This is going to be my, my third summit. And before I, I say anything else, I'd really like to thank David Scherna and Eric Weinmayer for 
developing a community where there is such an importance placed on redefining boundaries and overcoming obstacles and, and expanding limits that you and the world has set for whatever condition you have, for whatever place you are. And I think it's amazing that we all can stand here and I can talk to all of you, which is terrifying, by the way. Uh, because without this, I, I don't know what would fill the gap. I don't know what would give people hope when they feel alone or they feel sad. So uh, a big round of applause for those two and everyone involved with No Barriers. Uh, and for any of you who haven't completed a summit, I can tell you from personal experience that you're going to have a blast and you're not going to want to leave. So enjoy what you have right now and prepare for the one later on, okay? Um, and with, with that being said, uh, I'd like to implore you to take the No Barriers uh, Challenge and to take the pledge. Now, go out into the world and adopt the No Barriers ethos into your own personal philosophy. Engage your community. Share what you learn here with people who don't have the opportunity to be here like you. Because I know that this place is special. I know that this place is magical. And there aren't a lot of people that are as great as the people that are here. Uh, <laughs> so please. Go out and, and spread the love and show the world how amazing this group is, this organization is. Uh, go do something awesome. Go do something to challenge yourself. Go do something that makes you think, wow, I can't believe I did that. And to add some weight to my words and to give the sharks a second chance, I'd like to pledge a second Alcatraz uh, swim to raise funds and awareness for no barriers. Simply put, no barriers makes the world more awesome. So go and contribute to that awesome. Thank you. And, and Jack, is it true that you invested that $50,000 in the Chinese stock market? I admit to nothing. OK, good. He's going to be swimming over there to try and recoup that. Uh, speaking of jokes, uh, we have Mr. Josh Blue, who will be over at the table on uh, stage left over to our right, and he's got the Delete t-shirt, he's got CDs, and you go over and chill with him, get some autographs, hang out with him, he can teach you a little bit with his joke clinics. I'm gonna give this back here. So Echo, how is Echo doing right now? Echo is so chill, right? So there was this blind guy, he walks out of his house, and he takes his seeing eye dog by the tail, and he spins it around in a circle. <laughs> And his neighbor goes, hey, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, sorry, just taking a look around. <laughs> Josh Blue didn't tell me that, but Eric Weinmayer did. True story. And I, th I thought I saw Eric laughing so hard, there were tears coming out. His artificial eyes are somewhere on the ground right now, swimming in joy. Okay. Amy Van Dyken is a six-time gold medalist competing in the 1996 and 2000 Summer Olympic Games. She has numerous world records, also American and world titles. Just over a year ago, she was in a severe ATV accident that left her paralyzed. She is here tonight to share her story, vulnerability, courage, and the power of the possible. Please welcome Amy Van Dyken. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. How are you? Good. Anybody else out there freezing to death? You're like, I'm so cold I can barely feel my legs. Anyway, bad joke. Sorry. If you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at, right? Anyway, I want to thank you guys for having me. This is so special. I never thought that I would be speaking in front of a community like this, but now that I am, I am so honored. Uh, my life started off very differently than you see now. Um, I was able-bodied. I was, for the most part, healthy, except for the fact that I had asthma and severe asthma, and not just one type, all three types. And, you know, you had the allergy-induced, exercise-induced, infection-induced. People say, well, what were you allergic to? And I say the easiest way to say this was anything that lives and breathes, 
anything that ever has once lived and breathed, and anything that can spontaneously jump up and st start living and breathing, like I'm allergic to, so I'm gonna have an asthma attack. I'm also allergic to chlorine, right? So that with the exercise induced asthma, I'm convinced my mother was trying to kill me. It's neither here nor there. I felt that my life was really normal, right? I would always have friends over to my house to spend the night as opposed to going to their house because, heaven forbid, if they would have a dog, a cat, or a goldfish, I would go into an asthmatic attack and then it would all be over. And everything was, like I said, normal until I'm six years old. And you know that's when you go to first grade, right? You're so cool. You bring your lunch to school and you go outside and you get to play to recess and you go on field trips. and. I found what was supposed to be my husband in the first grade, and I was so excited when he actually came towards me one day. And I started thinking like, oh my gosh, is he gonna get on one knee? Like, what is my dress gonna look like? Are we gonna have a big wedding or a small wedding? Like, I think it should be just a little intimate thing in the mountains, perhaps. And he looked at me and he said, why are you so weird? And I said, well, uh, huh? And he goes like, you don't do things with us. Like, why are you so weird? And I said, well, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't breathe. And he said, whatever, Amy, we learned in Mrs. Barker's science class, you have to breathe to live, so like, what's your problem? I'm like, I don't know. And I went home and I cried to my mom. And my mom, of course, what all moms do, they want to make it better, right? So she didn't know how to make it better, but the doctor knew how to make it better. Oh, oh the all-knowing doctor, right? Right, so we go in there, gotta love it, because he says, you know, Amy, we gotta exercise your lungs. And I said, oh, raise my hand. And finally, he called on me after a few minutes. Amy, do you have a question? And I said, yeah, how am I supposed to exercise my lungs when I can't walk up and down a flight of stairs by myself? And he thought, and he said, huh. Well, water sports, we hear water sports is great for asthmatics. Awesome. Signed up for swimming, diving, synchro. Yay. First day of diving practice. There I was. I had my hair pulled back in a ponytail. I had my sunscreen on. I had my Speedo on. I looked very cute. And I walked out to the edge of the diving board and at the ripe age of six, I discovered two things about myself that I didn't already know. The first one is, I am not coordinated. So you want me to take three steps, hurdle, jump, twist, and not break an arm off? Was not happening. And the second thing, as I stood there and I looked down, I am deathly afraid of heights. So I called it a day, climbed off the diving board, but I wasn't discouraged because the next day was, was synchro practice. So there I was. I had my hair slicked back, I had my sequins on, my eyelashes were going, and once again, I looked very cute. And the music started, put the nose plug on, jumped in the water, and I was upside down underwater for like an hour and a half, and as I was under there, I discovered two things about myself again that I didn't already know. First thing is, I am not graceful. So the whole water ballet thing, not happening. And the second thing, as I was underwater for like an hour and a half, there's something wrong with my nose and the nose plug because I had water shooting straight up into my brain, which after we talked for a while explains a lot. I wasn't discouraged. Next day was swim practice. There I was. I had my swim cap on, my goggles on, my Speedo on. I had a kickboard under my arms, a pull buoy, or a pull buoy between my legs. I had flippers on, and I looked like a complete and total dork. And anyone that says swimmers are so hot, but Michael Phelps, whatever. We don't look cool. Let's just call it a day. And I jumped in the pool and I found my calling. Like, this was my life. And I know you guys are saying, yeah, you won six gold medals. Well, yeah, it took me six more years to finish one length of the swimming pool. Like, not 50 meters, 25 yards. I was that kid that you feel so bad for when you watch them swim. Like, they say, take your marks, and the arms go out, and they start looking around to see what's going on. The gun goes off, they do that belly flop, and everyone goes, oh, God, that had to hurt, and it did. I'd take a couple strokes, and I'd hang on the lane line, and I'd like, <laughs> mom. Just cute until you're 11, and then it loses its oomph. When I was 12 years old, I finished my first length at the pool, and you would have thought that I was Janet Evans. I jumped out of that pool, I ran over to my mom and dad, and I said, oh my gosh, dad, next time I'm gonna win. My dad said, shh, they can hear you. <laughs> well, the next time I swam, I was 13 years old, and I won my very first blue ribbon. I got addicted to winning. So in order to continue winning, because I felt at that time that I was like Janet Evans and Matt Biondi and that I was going to be the next greatest thing since sliced bread, but first you had to try out for my high school swim team, which had won state championships since the earth had cooled. 
So I was very nervous. And this was at the time when you had to try out, right? Like not the time when everyone got an A or everyone got a medal, and every, right? So I tried out and they only took the top 28 swimmers. And they posted that list up on the board and I remember running over there and starting at number one, which at the time made complete and total sense to me. Now I look and go, <laughs> silly girl, start going down. And I got to about 15, 16 and my stomach started to turn. 19, 20, and I was like, this is ridiculous, my head is pounding, 21, 22, you have got to be kidding me, my life's goal is going to be over in a, just a split second. There I was, number 28, and I had made my high school swim team. Thank you so much. Whoop, whoop. That's how I felt, I was so stoked. And I remember towards the end of the year, the coach put me on the relay team that had like basically won state since the dinosaurs roamed, right? So. I was nervous. I was sitting behind the block and I had a towel around my head and I'm sitting there and I'm doing that thing that we all do. Okay, seriously, if I don't mess up, then I won't beat up my sister. Maybe I'll beat my brother, but I won't beat up my sister and I'll eat all my broccoli, I promise. And as I did that, the other three girls from my relay team walked in front of me. And obviously they didn't see me standing there because whatever, my life forever. It was the 80s, so bear with me, okay? Uh, Ma God. I know, like, Amy Van Dyken's like totally on a relay. Like, gag me with the spoon. And I thought, who are you to tell me what I can and can't do? Well, we went on and we won the relay team. By the time I was a junior, I was breaking state records and everything I swam. By the time I was a senior, I had qualified for Olympic trials in the 92 Olympics, and I had a chance to go to any school I wanted to go to. I chose the University of Arizona. People ask why. They take you places that you really want to see. So for me, they brought me to Fraternity Row. Drunk men with their shirts off. Sign me up. Bear down. First day of swim practice, they're talking about how it's an unusual year because it's an Olympic year. And who here has Olympic trial qualifying times? And people raise their hands and I went, oh my goodness world record holders, gold medalists, and me, Amy. And everyone raised their hand. And I heard, Van Dyken, huh? Don't you have trial cuts? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're going to trials too, and here's what we're gonna do. I was like, that's sweet. <laughs> I went to the 1992 Olympics, and I swam two events. I swam the 100 butterfly, and I would like to preface this by saying I hate butterfly. Whoever invented butterfly should be kicked seriously hard in the teeth. Like you are just stu, have you ever seen that stroke? It's the one where you do this thing and you and you know, whatever. I also qualified for the 50 free. The 100 butterfly, I qualified 12. The 50 free is my baby, I love it, it is my race. It's a splash and dash, basically you don't have to think. You dive in, hit the wall, I can't even mess that up. I just wanted an opportunity to make the Olympics. And in order to do that, you have to get first or second, but in order to get that, you have to be top eight. I qualified eighth. They marched us out, everyone's walking, and I'm looking down because the ground is wet. We've already determined I'm not graceful or not coordinated, so if I fall, it's not gonna be pretty. So staring down at the ground, I got to my lane, stood behind it, and I started doing this. Now you guys all see the athletes do this, right? You know what this is, right? It's the grown-up potty dance. You know that, right? Little, little kids cross their legs and like, you know, woohoo! No, no, athletes can't do that, so we grown-up potty dance. So I'm doing this, and as I do that, they started in lane one. In lane one, Betty Sue Smith. She has night bajillion world records, eight million gold medals. She was on the cover of Vogue. Isn't she beautiful? Everyone clapped. I went, oh, what the? By the time they got to the girl next to me, if at any point during the race she was going too slow, she could jump up on top of the water and run across it. <laughs> and in lane eight, she has a blue ribbon when she was 13, seriously? Amy Vandeker, oh no, and I raised my hand. I swam the race and I didn't know if I should be happy or sad. Happy I won a best time, sad I missed the Olympic team by one one hundredth of a second. I know, it was this hair on my knee right there. <laughs> as soon as laser came out, I zapped that sucker as fast. Mm. Do you want your whole leg? No, that, right there. I went up to my mom and dad and I said, hey dad, guess what? It's okay, don't be, don't be discouraged. I'm gonna go to the 96 games. You know, I'd like to swim more than one thing. My dad stood up and said, did everyone hear that? My daughter's going to the 1996 Olympics. Dad, shut up, someone might hear you. 
trained and I trained and I trained. Finally, it happened. I qualified for the 1996 Olympics in five events. I woke up the next morning, ran to the bathroom. Thank you. Woohoo! You're looking good too. Ran to the mirror because I am an Olympian, long flowing hair, right? Clear complexion. And of course, you know me, the hottest boyfriend that ever created. Uh, yeah, it never happened. I didn't know when I was going to feel like an Olympian. Like, when does this epiphany happen? So I asked a friend of mine, Summer Sanders, who lives here in Park City, Summer, when did you feel like an Olympian? And she said, when we went through the gates of the Olympic Village, that's when I felt it. Awesome, because we were on the bus and we were ready to go, and I was from here to that white tent away from, from feeling like an Olympian. And we're almost there, and they stop the bus. Soldiers on the bus, under the bus, on top of the bus. What are they looking for? A bomb? Are you kidding me? I turn around to talk to the person behind me. They're ruining my moment. Don't they know this is my moment? And as I was complaining, we went through the Olympic Village and I missed my moment. <laughs> a couple days later, everyone was dressed in really, really ugly outfits. And I know that everyone goes, oh, it was so cute. I have to get one of those Roots hats. They're really ugly, I'm here to tell you. And I went down, I saw Janet Evans, who had gone to literally the Olympics since the Olympics were created in swimming. And I said, Janet, why is everyone dressed up? Well, Janet knows that I went to school on an athletic scholarship, not academic, so she speaks slower to me. She said, Amy, we're going to opening ceremonies because the Olympics start tomorrow. Huh, awesome, high five. And I went back to do what swimmers do, shave. And I turned on the Olympics, because why not? We're there, we might as well watch it, right? And what happened to me, I'm going to tell you, I changed my world because I'm here to tell you, when you have your moment, do not have a razor directed at an appendage. <laughs> NBC was running those commercials, 500 days till the start of the Centennial Olympic Games in Atlanta, right? What I heard was, Tomorrow, Amy Van Dyken takes on the world in the 100-meter freestyle. Oh, no. I swam the 100-meter freestyle, and I got fourth. Again, happy because I got a best time. Fourth, I was just out of the medals. And I was notorious for leg cramps. And I had some leg cramps. And what do they tell you in PE? Like, you get leg cramps after running. You're not supposed to, what, sit down. So what did I do? Sat down went and stood back up and collapsed, because again, I'm not graceful, not coordinated, and it was really loud. Everyone came running. My massage therapist, Plumber Crack, was on worldwide TV. He still thanks me to this day for that. And it was a big to-do. And I went and said, listen, I don't want people to think it was an asthma attack. It was just leg cramps. So I went and I had my massage and I ate and I went back to the village and I sat down with the coaches and they went over my time and they said, you know, Aim, Thanks for coming, and like, you know what? We're so glad you're here. You can cheer on the team, but maybe this isn't your Olympics. Maybe you just need to go. Will people fill in for you? And I said, who are you to tell me what I can and can't do? The next day was a relay. One thing that could hurt a relay is if, uh, actually there's two things. One, if someone forgot their swimsuit, we checked, double checked, and triple checked, everyone had their swimsuits on. And another one is a rookie who is nervous, and we had one of those. So in front of the world, we had Poland, Germany, China, Japan, the United States. We did a cheer just for you to make you proud. Big dog, little dog, bouncing pup. Come on, team, chew them up. Woohoo! <laughs> I used to actually be able to touch my toe up here, but not, not anymore. Woohoo! Anyway, thank you. <laughs> we went out. And not only did we get a world record and a gold medal, I went the fastest split in history in the event that I had collapsed in the night before. Tell me what for. Thank you. The night after that was the 100 butterfly. I hate the butterfly. I qualified second. My coaches said, you're going to win this thing. And I'm like, didn't you just tell me I should go home? Anyway, whatever. That night we went out and started swimming and I'm swimming and I hit the wall halfway and one thing that coaches will tell you not to do is to look around. What did I do? I looked around. Woohoo, I'm in fourth. One more spot, I get my own medal. Swimming and I'm swimming and I get about halfway and underwater I could hear the crowd. It was so loud. I could feel it in my gut. And what went on in my head? Someone from the United States must be swimming really fast. I hope it's Angel. She's so nice. I really like her. She deserves to win a gold medal. That would be so awesome if she did. <laughs> and I hit the wall and I turned around and I went, what is that one? What is that? Does anybody know what that one is? And I hear Amy Van Dyken wins the gold medal from the United States of America. And I went, oh my God! 
Hannah. Thank you. Thank you. The day after that was another relay. Something happened in the ready room that had never happened to me ever, and I hope never happens to anybody ever again. There was a young 14-year-old, no one knows her name, Amanda Beard, Teddy Bear, anyway. Um, she comes to me and she says, Amy, I've never been on a relay before. I don't know how to do a relay start. Huh? You what? So I said to her, okay, well, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to yell go, and when I yell go, you go. She said, okay, so when you yell go, just go. Great. So she's up on the blocks, the swimmer's coming in, and I scream, go, and she takes off. We end up winning, getting a gold medal, setting a world record, and we went to the media room, and the press says, wow, Amy, you are so supportive of Amanda. Like, have you been friends for a long time? I said, no, actually, I was telling her to go. And they were like, that's so awesome. So you've been friends for a while? I'm like, no, I was really just, never mind. You guys are morons. Anyway, <laughs> I'm in the media. I can say it. <laughs> so I look at my stash, and I've got three gold medals. And I thought, earrings and a necklace, how cute. Huh, one more wouldn't hurt, right? It was the 50 free. I told you, this is my baby. I went ahead and qualified in the morning. And at night, 30 minutes before you're about ready to rip the heads off these other girls for a gold medal, they put you in a room with no windows, one door, and a TV, and that's it, and you're supposed to remain civil. Huh? I didn't know why, so I took my chair, and I saw there was a young lady there from China who had won a gold medal, broke a world record earlier in the meet. She would know what's going on, right? So as I spun my chair around and sat down, I said, oh, God, I don't speak Chinese. But I didn't want to be that person that like, oh, never mind, let me move. So for the next half hour, I turned around, and she was about a foot in front of me, and I just stared at her. swimmers, everybody up! And I'm like, oh my God, it's me. So I jumped up. My friend from China is in front of me. I'm staring at the back of her head because again, not graceful, not coordinated, already fell down once in the swim meet. Don't need that to happen again. Got out behind the block, started doing grown up potty dance. Turned around and I stared at her. And she did something in the years that I've swum against her she's never done. She looked down. And I knew I had won. But I thought, there's a lot of people that paid good money for this. Let's give them a show, shall we? And as I did that, I, I kind of noticed, and I'll tell you guys this story. I don't tell many people this story, but my mouth got really dry. And I was looking for my water bottle, and I didn't bring one. So I looked, and I said, oh, huh, swimming pool, water, right? So I bent down, and I put it in my mouth. And as I swished it around and was about ready to swallow, I thought, how many people from how many different countries with how many different bathing and potty habits have been in this pool the past week. And I thought, would you swallow it? No. So I looked at my friend from China. I couldn't speak because I had the water. And I, pfft, pfft, it's just in her lane. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> they called us to the blocks, and there's no unnecessary noise on the blocks. It's completely silent. I'm an asthmatic. I have phlegm. <laughs> Everyone looked at me like I was crazy, and I was like, oh, I don't know, Lem, I don't know. Swimmers, take your marks. And the gun went off, and the last thing that went through my head was, it's yours, go get it. I hit the wall, and I didn't realize what was about ready to happen to my life. I saw my coach crying, and I'd always wanted to make that man cry. It was kind of like a little payback, but really it felt good. And there was a mixed zone where there's media on one side, chain links, linked fence, and then us on the other side. And one of the guys from Colorado, his name was Ed Green. Any of you guys from Colorado might know him. And he said, there you go. Ed's dad back there. Nice job. Um, he said, Amy, we're going live in 30 seconds. Can I grab you? And I said, absolutely. He goes, all right, I'm here with Amy Van Dyke and blah, blah, blah. So Amy, how did it feel to break the Olympic record? Well, I blo broke the Olympic record my time. I said, everything that athletes say, right? It was a great start. It was a great blah, blah, blah. You just want athletes to tell you the truth. We never will. And he looked at me confused, and he goes, well, no, you're the first American woman to ever win four gold medals in one Olympics. I looked dead in the camera and said, shut up! <laughs> so after that, you have to redeem yourself. I went on to try out for the 2000 games. I was showing off for a boy, doing a snatch. As I stood up, my, armpit went, my uh, shoulder went right through my armpit. 18 months of rehab later, 
I was out for my first race, dove in, shot my arms forward, snap, crackle, and pop. I heard them. I don't eat Rice Krispies. Right there in the shoulder. Took off my goggles, just filled with tears. Dara Torres, again, someone who no one knows. I don't know why I bring up these names. Anyway, she goes, why are you crying? Because you got fourth. Thank you. Now I am. It's like, no, my shoulder hurts. Six months to the day of Olympic trials, they told me that I was having surgery that would end my career. And who are you to tell me what I can and can't do? I qualified for three more events, two more gold medals. Thank you. The coolest sound that you will ever hear, will you please rise for the playing of the national anthem of the United States of America? And it goes silent. And I thought, how many people are celebrating right now for something that I just did? And it was the coolest feeling ever, a dream come true. So what do you do after you win six gold medals? You marry a Denver Bronco, free tickets. <laughs> so I did, it was awesome. I was the only female on national sports talk radio at the time, living large. I was working with Rob Dibble. Anybody, anybody know Rob Dibble? Yeah, he's a pitcher who would throw things at people in the stands for not paying attention. So working with him was fun. Love him, actually, really. And I was on a hiatus, and I thought, well, let's go to the mountains in Arizona. We've got a house there. Awesome. June 6, 2014 was a day just like any other day. I woke up, walked the dog, went to CrossFit, had a great old time, met the CrossFit box owner. He's a firefighter, DJ, awesome. We decided that I was not cooking because <laughs> I don't cook. So we were going to go out to dinner, and my husband said, let's take the truck. And I said, no, babe, it's a beautiful night. Why don't you take your motorcycle? I'll take my ATV. And he said, all right. So we went to dinner. I had trout and steamed broccoli. I bring this up because for your last meal, why don't you have something exciting like a cheeseburger? Thank you. I remember standing up and pushing my chair in, and that is it. I remember waking up the next day, but what I didn't know was what happened at night. My husband heard me go over a six-foot embankment. The ATV landed on my back landed on my head, <laughs> eh, explains a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> he noticed that my back was broken, but I was face down. He rolled me over, I wasn't breathing, lifted up my neck, I started to convulse, eyes went two different directions, and this happened for quite a few minutes. Flight for Life came in, I met my Flight for Life helicopter pilot just a couple days ago, she's about that big, real badass, anyway. I woke up the next day in the hospital, and what I woke up to was my neurosurgeon saying, Amy, Look at my phone. This is your x-ray. And I saw it. Your vertebrae are supposed to be like this. Mine was like this. And this one was touching my aorta. He said, Amy, I'm working in nanometers. And I'm giving you an 80% shot. You're not making it. So I need you to say goodbye to your husband. So I looked at my husband. And I said, I love you. Move on. I know you're laughing because you know what's coming next totally said goodbye. And he looked at me and he said, if this is too much, you can let go. I said, who are you to tell me what I can and can't do? So I am here, like a lot of you who have survived a lot of nasty stuff. But what I did was I went and I got a tattoo. It's a phoenix. And underneath the phoenix is my last wonky heart rate and it goes into my very first normal sinus rhythm. So when I look at it, I realize where I have been and where I am, and it can be a lot worse. And as I woke up, I looked at my husband, and aside from saying who's the hot blonde in the corner, I forgot I needed to rescind that whole thing. I was so excited to be alive, and they said, Amy, you're never gonna walk again. I said, can I get a purple wheelchair with skulls on it? And they said, yes, I said, awesome then let's do this thing. Because listen, we're here. Things could be a lot worse. And I talked to a, a friend earlier who uh, is a wounded warrior. She's a Marine. She's about this big, mini Marine. Hoorah. And I said, we always, every one of us here has bad days. We wake up and sometimes things just absolutely suck for some of us. It's putting on your pants in the morning. Others of us have other things that we have to deal with. 
But take that thing and instead of making it a day, let's make it a moment because you don't know what's around the corner. I refuse to be a sourpuss. I refuse to have a bad day because I don't know what's around the corner. And if it is my last day and if it is my last breath, I don't want to be known as a sourpuss. So don't be known as a sourpuss. Rock it out. Keep doing what you're doing. And thank you for having me. I love you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give it up for... Test, test. Give it up for Amy Van Dyken. Give it up, give it up. No barriers. Make some noise. And also Sarah here from Greeley, Colorado, and then Berlin back here from Salt Lake City, Utah. RASL interpreters, please. Deaf clapping. Indeed. Uh, and then the volunteers. Who is a volunteer at this event that's present right now? Please stand up if you're a volunteer. Put your hand in the air if you're a volunteer. Uh, the board of directors for No Barriers, I know you're here as well. All the people that work for No Barriers, I know you're here. Let's please celebrate that volunteer spirit. And now we'd like to throw it over to our man, Dave Sherna, who is going to be closing our ceremonies and checking in as well with John Bramblett. Dave, come on out here. Thank you so much, uh, Timmy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Josh. And uh, to finish off here, we have the completion of our elevation image. Elevation is one of our six No Barriers Life elements. And uh, we're going to put the light on it for you all to see. All right. And uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, how, you, how you managed to create this extraordinary image. Well, guys, I just wanted to, to thank you guys for all the energy that you've been giving. Uh, whenever I was sighted, I saw colors in a very lazy sort of way. And now it, uh, color for me is energy. And you guys have been putting the best energy. It's like electric colors. So that's what the lights are for and all that. It's, it's colors that are brighter, colors that work with light. I just want to thank you guys so much. It's been a, it's been a, a real privilege to stand up here and hear all the energy that's coming this way. It's just been awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, um, I won't try to clip that again, but I want to thank everyone for uh, sticking out for the weather. It ended up being a beautiful night, and I want to wish you all a wonderful next few days. All of you are going to go out on your, your adventures tomorrow, enjoy them, meet some new folks, learn some new things. Uh, I have just a couple logistics items for you. If you're taking a, uh, a bus or a shuttle to your clinic, all of the shuttles depart from the sundial, which is off to my right here. There's a big sign above it that says sundial. If you need any help finding it, there's going to be a lot of volunteers around. Those are for things that are off-site, so please make your way to the sundial if you have a, a transportation need to your clinics, and that's all inside of your, um, your program. So you can find out where everything is. We've got a lot of staff and volunteers to help get you to where you need to be. Throughout the next three days, we will have some big community gatherings. A lot of us will go into small groups in the mornings and the afternoons, but our community gathering times, aside from meals, are gonna be in the uh, early late afternoon for our No Barriers University, which I hope you guys attend, which is gonna be at the Grand Summit Hotel. Also, we're gonna have a wonderful celebration at the National Ability Center. We'll have a film festival. There'll be shuttles for that. So please, please plan to join us as a full group where you can hear stories of what everyone did the, during the day. That's one of my most fun times is to hear what everyone did. And then we'll close it out here with the closing ceremony on Sunday. So go out and uh, discover that what's within you is stronger than what's in your way. Have a great night and a great summit.